All right, let's go ahead and get underway. Thank you so much to everyone who is here with us for this conversation with the winner of the 2024 Elia Salida Excellence in Research Award. We will be speaking today with Dr. Sivan Zakai about her children's learning about Israel project. And she will be in conversation today with Dr. Susan Cardos. We are so pleased to have them both with us today uh, for this wonderful conversation. And we want to thank as well the Salida family for their support of this award and Genesis Philanthropy Group for their support. Uh, and we are uh, always excited to bring the wonderful research uh, that uh, is uh, being honored by this award to our JFN audience. And so grateful to have Dr. Zakai and Dr. Cardos with us today. Uh, I want to take a moment and introduce them both to you. Uh, and I'm going to um, add them here so you can see them both. Uh, first, I want to introduce Dr. Sivan Zakai, who is the Sarah S. Lee Associate Professor of Jewish Education at the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion in Los Angeles. She directs the Children's Learning About Israel Project and co-directs the Learning and Teaching About What Matters Project. Um, and Sivan is also senior editor of the Journal of Jewish Education and a member of the faculty at the Mandel Teacher Educator, Teacher Educator Institute. Her books include the National Jewish Book Award winning My Second Favorite Country, How American Jewish Children Think About Israel, and the recently released Teaching Israel, Studies of Pedagogy from the Field. And she will be in conversation with Dr. Susan Cardos, who is Chief Strategy and Advancement Officer at the Abraham Joshua Heschel School in Manhattan. Previously, Susan served as Senior Director of Strategy and Education Planning at the Avi Chai Foundation and as Research Affiliate for the Project on the Next Generation of Teachers at the Harvard University Graduate School of Education. And she began her career as an elementary and middle school teacher. So Susan uh, has multiple vantage points from which to think about Sivan's research today. She also serves as co-chair of the board of the Collaborative for Applied Studies in Jewish Education, whose mission is to strengthen Jewish education through high quality applied research. And Kasji was a partial supporter of Sivan's work in partnership with the Mandel Center. So Susan has been an admirer of Sivan's work for many years and uh, it's just, lovely to be able to feature them both in conversation with each other. Uh, so uh, so that our attendees know, uh, there will be an opportunity for you all to pose your own questions later in the session. So please, if there is anything that you are wondering about and want to ask Dr. Zakai, uh, please drop it in the Q&A function. Um, that is where we will be pulling questions later in the session. Uh, and without further ado, I am very happy to hand things off to Dr. Cardos and Dr. Zakai. Thank you, thank you, Beth. If you can hear me, give me a thumbs up. Just me. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, great. Um, so great to be here. First, I, I wanna thank Beth and, and JFN for putting this program together and giving us all the privilege of being able to hear about Sivan's work from Sivan. Um, I wanna thank all of you uh, who are attending for your interest um, in learning with us this afternoon. Um, and I wanna especially thank my longtime colleague, Sivan Zakai for doing this brilliant, careful, systematic, long and painstaking and extremely important work and giving it to the Jewish people so that Jewish children may flourish. It's my absolute honor to be in this conversation um, this afternoon. So thank you, Sivan. Um, and before we start, I just want to acknowledge um, our shared 
pain and sorrow about what happened on October 7th and all that's happened since then. I know you all um, join me in sending your love and your prayers to all of the captives and their families and to the fallen and the injured and the widowed and the orphaned and the traumatized and the displaced and all who know and love them and may peace and healing come to all of us quickly. Um, transition. Um, so Sivan, um, for all um, of those who are not familiar with your groundbreaking work, um, how would you summarize the three most important findings um, of relevance to educators and education leaders? Um, thank you, Susan, for those beautiful introductory words. And I want to echo an amen to your prayer. And I also want to thank Beth for the introduction and the Salida family and the Genesis Philanthropy Group for making all of this possible. And also Kashi and the Mandel Center at Brandeis University for supporting this work for a very, very long time. This is a longitudinal study in which I followed a group of children from the age of five, from the time they entered kindergarten through the end of middle school. And if I had to summarize the three most important things that I learned from really years of careful listening to children, it's these three things. First of all, children know a lot of information about Israel, about um, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, about life in the Middle East and about Jewish life around the world. And they know this information much, much younger than we possibly could have anticipated before. The second thing that I learned is that we have two choices. <laughs> we can either therefore talk to children about these things much younger than we anticipated, or we cannot, but if we don't, children will turn to Google or Alexa instead of to us. And the third thing is that from the age of five, children of every age know that Israel is currently and has been involved in an ongoing, often violent conflict. And also what children understand at each age is a little bit different. So children of every age know about the conflict, but children build new ideas and theories about what it is and what is happening as they grow. Great, thank you. Um, and for people who aren't familiar with the work, can you say a little bit about the study itself, your methods and um, how you, the time frame of the study and how you came to these findings? Sure. Um, a longitudinal study, that's just a fancy word for saying, talking to the same people again and again and again and again, year after year. So there were 35 children involved in this project, and those same children spoke with me again and again and again from the age of five to the age of 14. And, um, and I used three primary methods to get at children's ideas. One is interviewing. So I'd ask children questions, some of them very serious questions like, what is Israel or where is Israel? And some of them very playful, like if an alien came down from outer space and didn't understand anything about life on earth, but did speak English, how would you explain to the alien what it means to be Jewish, what it means to be American, what it means to be Israeli? I also did something with children called photo and music elicitation, which is just showing children prompts, for example, a headshot of the Israeli prime minister or the US president or flags of Israel, or the Palestinian flag, or the American flag, and saying, hey, talk to me about what you know. That's just a way of eliciting more information that kids can give in interviews. And also something called storytelling exercises, where I asked children to tell me stories about things that were happening in Israel that they knew about. Thank you. I mean, just to, to say, you rarely find um, great education research. A, that's longitudinal. It's really hard to get people to stick with you for 10 years. Um, and undergo the uh, uh, the interviews and and just even sometimes it's hard to keep track of the people and also those methods to use um, a multi multitude of different methods to elicit answers. It's really, um, it, it, people should understand how rare and unique and brilliant it is. So thank you, Sivan, for doing work. Um, so you, you've said that understanding how young people view the world is an essential foundation for good teaching practice. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about why, what, what you mean by that? Why is it so essential? And what happens when teachers don't have that understanding? 
Sure. Susan, can you do a thought experiment with me and everyone else here on this call? Can you imagine if a mathematics teacher knew a lot about mathematics, like they knew algebra, they knew calculus, but they had no idea how their learners could come to understand mathematical terms and concepts? That would be a bonkers world. How could you possibly be a great teacher if you knew so much about algebra and geometry, but you had no idea what are the questions that learners have as they come to engage with the ideas of mathematics? And yet that's exactly what we've had in the world of Israel education for quite a long time. We have really talented, really brilliant educational leaders who know a lot about Israel, but we as a field didn't know very much about how children themselves come to learn, think, and feel about Israel. And so really the underlying goal of this research was to give that really crucial missing information to the field because one of the essential pieces of knowledge for teachers is not only content information, but also an understanding of how learners themselves come to understand that content. So that's that's a critical implication for educators. Can you talk also about implications of your findings? You can even stick to the three main findings. Um, implications of your findings for education leaders, for learning environments, JCCs, preschools, day schools, synagogue schools, youth groups, um, implications of your findings for those types of organizations and for education leaders. Sure. And I and I'm also want to add, I know we're going to also talk about this separately, but also for philanthropists, we have been living in a world for a very long time where for very, very good reasons, we have, we collectively, the Jewish people of North America, have poured an incredible amount of time and effort and resources into developing educational program for teenagers and for college age students. And that is really, really crucial work. And also, as this project has made abundantly clear, children do not start to think, young people, young Jews do not start to think about big questions about identity and belonging and politics and conflict when they're in high school. They start to think about those questions when they're in kindergarten. And so the primary implication, I think, for all educational leaders, but also for kind of us collectively as a Jewish people, is that we cannot ignore those younger grades as we think about educational programming and resources and the time and effort that our community invests in young people. Um, teenagers are important as are college age students for sure. But if we leave our children until then to have deep and meaningful conversations, then we have missed years and years and years where they are thinking about and having profound questions about all sorts of questions about who we are and what does it mean to have a home and a homeland that is far away and be part of a Jewish people that doesn't always agree on everything and is living in an increasingly polarized world. Um, when you think about the two things that you just said were really about methods and less about content. And I'm just wondering if, if you get asked or if I can ask um, if there are particular um, content implications for- sure. There are so many content implications. I will try and limit myself to two, and then you can feel free to push back on me. So one um, amazing thing that I learned from the children when they were in the youngest part of the study, really the kindergarten, first and second grade years, is that children, five, six, seven, eight, know a ton. They have really profound, big questions about the world, but you know what they don't really understand? they really don't understand the nested nature of geography, by which I mean the idea that you could have a landmark like the Kotel that sits inside a city like Jerusalem, which sits inside a state of Israel. And by the way, state of Israel is different when a different use of the word state than state of Massachusetts, right? That's actually a country which sits in a region. And yet almost all of the resources that have been created for young Jewish children take Jewish children on a geographic tour of Israel. Let's go visit the beach in Tel Aviv. Let's go visit the Kotel in Jerusalem. Let's go visit the Dead Sea. And that is absolutely beyond the grasp 
of children before approximately third grade. And yet all of the resources that we have for young children are built around geography. Young children have profound, beautiful, big ideas and questions about culture and community and about what it means to have a country that speaks a language and um, has diverse customs and practices, but not geography. So we have a mismatch in a lot of places, and that's one of them, between the resources that we have developed and the developmental capacities of young children. Um, it also goes the other way. That's a, that's a place where we have resources that are probably mismatched because they're too hard for children, but many more instances we have resources that are mismatched because they're actually not sophisticated enough for children, and conflict-based resources is top of my list in that category. Um, even five-year-olds, it, it really struck me. Almost every interview I've had with kindergartners and first graders, if I would ask an open-ended question like, hey, what is Israel? Children's answers will sound something like this. Israel is the place where the Jewish soldiers fight and die. Young children are thinking about the conflict and yet most of the conflict re educational resources that we have are for teenagers, not for children. And so in both cases, we have a mismatch between what is available and what children's developmental capacities are. Did you, did you rely entirely on the voices and ideas of the students or did you also speak with their teachers? Okay, so the teachers and parents were not formally part of the study and yet, many of them in a way that was unsolicited reached out to me with their own stories. So um, some parents in particular, every time they had a conversation around the dinner table, what's that happened to do with Israel would say, oh, we just had an interesting conversation. I thought you might, might like to hear about it. Um, the way I treated that as data is when adults' perceptions matched children's or gave kind of additional context I have included that in the research, but there are some times where actually the adults had a mismatch with the children's perception. And that often happens to do with conflict where adults say, I really don't wanna to talk to children about conflict and children say, I'm thinking about this all the time anyway. And in those cases, I, without, uh, without exception, prioritize the voice of children because they have been the ones um, missing in the research up until now. Um, and, and one more question on this. Can you help us understand how um, how children's either in, engagement with you about Israel or ideas about Israel or ability to talk about Israel changed over time? And 10 years is a long time. What did you learn about sort of that evolution, that development? Sure. Um, so I think there's a developmental trajectory about each subcomponent of Israel education. So I'm just going to kind of break those apart for a second and then I'll give one example, but there's an evolution in every single subcomponent because Israel studies is an interdisciplinary project that involves understanding about Hebrew language and culture that, un that involves understanding about history, heritage and the Jewish past, about um, political science, religious studies, et cetera. So um, because I know it's on a lot of people's minds at this moment, I will give you a quick, quick breakdown of children's understanding of conflict. And um, I will also say that children made similar leaps as they thought about history, as they thought about geography, as they thought about culture, because we are always growing and evolving as children. So um, in um, just a kind of really, really quick conflict evolution, in the early grades of elementary school, kindergarten and first grade, children absolutely understand that Israel is involved in an ongoing violent conflict. Children often use the language Israel and the other team. They don't at this stage typically have language for talking about with whom Israel is engaged in a conflict, but they know that that conflict exists. By the time kids hit second or third grade, they know excruciating, violent details about the conflict as it plays out in real time. And I just wanna pause because this is the thing that really surprises most people, second and third graders knowing excruciating, violent details. And 
this is the age at which children say, if you don't talk to us about it, that's cool. We can just search it up on Google. I mean, you can talk to us about it or not, but we will learn about it one way or the other. By the time kids hit the upper elementary grades for fourth and fifth grade, they have um, a layered understanding about not only, um, they also start to have a much bigger vocabulary and they can start to say, it's not just about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but here's Iran's role in the conflict. Here's the United States' role as a broker in this conflict. And also this, those fourth grade and fifth grade years are where children start to develop cognitive empathy, which means that they can do a version of what I'm about to do for you right now. We, the Jewish people, believe that Israel, we have a claim to this land and also the Palestinian people believe we have a claim to this land. And so depending on the question you're asking, I, a fifth grader or fourth grader can answer it from multiple perspectives, um, but usually just from two perspectives. By the time kids hit middle school, they can kind of layer that and say, oh, wait a second, not all Jews believe about the same thing about the conflict and not all Arabs believe the same thing about the conflict. There's actually not just two ideas, but many. Um, and those middle school years are really when um, young people start to engage with the toxic discourse online and start to try and think about and often struggle with what is my role in the public square of the internet. Great, thank you. Um, just to, to stay on this idea of um, of student voices, of children's voices, um, you've referred to it as as like uh, the, the ethical dimension of of the research, um, and your desire to give give voice to them. Um, what have you learned? We've really focused on sort of educators and parents. What have you learned that policymakers and funders uh, really need to understand about Israel education? One of the things that I started learning from the children in this study when they were in approximately second grade is that there are all sorts of resources that are available for children who want to learn about current events in the context of the United States. If, for example, there's an election in the US and children have big questions, they might hear about it at the dinner table or on the radio, then one of the things that they can do is turn to a series of sources of news, current events that are curated specifically for children. These are things like Newzella or Time for Kids or the New York Times for Kids. Um, there are all sorts of news sources, but when children have questions about events that are taking place in Israel, there are no news sources to which they can turn. And there are textbooks and there are um, web pages, but there are no things that have ever been developed by any uh, anybody in the Jewish world that is the equivalent of times for Israel for kids. It doesn't exist yet. And yet that is exactly the kind of resource that children are clamoring for. And there's no current funding structure to make that happen. There's no institutional infrastructure in the Jewish world that would allow young people to get developmentally appropriate, reading level appropriate, real-time news about Israel. And yet the most profound questions that children have about Israel are not about Israeli history or culture, which remain relatively static. They are about current events, which are fluid and changing. Great. Um, I'm gonna pause for one second and encourage people to put questions into the Q&A. There are two questions here that I wanna summarize for you, Sivan, and um, I'd like you to answer them just because it, it might, in, in case people are stuck on these these particular um, topic that we you can we can you can help us get unstuck and then move forward. So their questions are about the sample. Um, can you describe the sample? And there are questions about uh, representativeness of the sample. And can you speak to the difference between having a representative sample and a sample that describes phenomenon? Okay. So um, I just want to start answering that by making sure that we are all on the same page about a fundamental idea about human development. And I'm about to say two like polar opposite things that sound like they contradict one another, but that we know are true about human development and that have been replicated in all sorts of ways um, across time and space. One, every child is unique and idiosyncratic. Every child is their own special self. Every parent knows this, 
Every educator knows this. Every grandparent knows this. Every child is beautiful in their own way. And also, children undergo common patterns of development. So as children learn fundamental ideas, concepts, and beliefs about the world, there is a kind of a recognizable pattern to how children understand ideas about numbers and how children understand ideas about geography and how children understand ideas about history, et cetera. So all of that is the background for this non-representative sample. Um, all of the children in this study were found initially in kindergarten because they were part of three Jewish day school communities that had agreed to partner with me for many, many years. One of those schools was reform, one conservative and one non-denominational community school. One of them had a very, very large Persian and Sephardic population, one predominantly Ashkenazi, and one had a mixed community with a large number of Israeli expatriate families. Um, and th the goal was to, to kind of capture a range of um, kids whose parents would allow me to study them. You should also know a backstory. We tried when these kids were in uh, first grade to recruit a, a similar sample in supplementary schools. And we had a lot of enthusiasm from those schools and we couldn't get parental commitment to study kids for that many years. Um, the amazing and crazy thing about longitudinal research though is that you follow children over time wherever they go. By first grade, several of these children had enrolled in public and in um, local charter schools. By third grade, one child had actually moved to Israel and attended a, a Israeli school and then came back to the United States. By the time these kids were in middle school, they were in a wide range of schools, including Jewish day schools, public schools, independent schools, um, charter schools. One child was homeschooled and um, the goal was to follow them. And really here, what I was looking for was patterns that were shared by kids with different experiences, different schooling experiences. The political beliefs of their families were radically different from one another. Um, and yet there were some really clear patterns. What age did children understand certain ideas about politics and political systems? What age did um, children understand certain ideas about history and historiography? And those were common despite the differences among children's schools and families and Jewish experiences. Um, could you just say, like, um, had you tried to do this study in a way where your sample was representative, meaning your findings could be generalized to the full population of Jewish American kids? I mean, yeah, I, I honestly, I don't even know how we could have done that um, to get a representative sample of an entire population, all of American Jewish youth would require knowing where these folks are getting them from various geographic locations, doing so randomly. Um, all of these things are massive hurdles to all educational research, but in the Jewish world where we don't have a centralized education system are really, um, I think, beyond the capacities of our current um, educational research infrastructure. I would add also, and you know, what might have been the goal, right? If you're trying to describe complex phenomenon over time, you know, really you want to be in conversation, like in deep conversation, face to face, eye to eye with kids over a long period of time. And that's really a different goal than um, doing a broad study that's generalizable to a full population. So for, for people who had those kinds of questions, if if there's more that you want Sivan to talk about, please please um I'll put them back into the into the QA and we'll we will have time at the end to go to go deeper into that. Um Back to, uh, to philanthropists. So I, I don't really personally believe it's the role of the researcher to sort of tell policymakers or teachers or leaders or philanthropists sort of what to do. I, I, I do think that the what to do is really dependent on the context in which you want to do that thing um, and also how you intend to implement that thing that you want to do. Um, but I do think it's, I, I think it would be very helpful, um, Sivan, for you to talk a little bit about the kinds of philanthropic investments, either in people or in organizations or systems, communities, um, what kind of investments might be necessary um, 
to support the kind of, of Israel education that your, your research implies that we need? I think the answer to that question is on multiple different levels, which means multiple different avenues into the into the challenge. Um, one is the importance of investing in research. And um, here I want to underscore again that the Jack Joseph and Morton Mendel Center for Studies in Jewish Education, and also with support from CASG, made it possible to do this research. And yet there are very, very few avenues for researchers who want to investigate deep and complicated phenomena in the Jewish world. And so um, I want to thank all of you on this call who take seriously the role of research in helping us understand what is, but also what could be in the Jewish world. Um, teacher professional learning is an essential part of the puzzle. As I said earlier in the conversation with our imaginary math teacher who knew a lot of math but didn't know anything about how children learn about math, um, we still have a lot of very, very talented, very committed Jewish professionals who have devoted their lives to the betterment of the Jewish people and to supporting Jewish children, and yet who still do not understand how Jewish children think and feel and learn about Israel and all sorts of other educational um, subject areas in Jewish education. And so continuing to support ongoing learning and professional development for um, school leaders and camp leaders and youth movement leaders and the educators that work within their institutions is also quite crucial, um, as is developing the kinds of resources that could help children better flourish and learn that we just don't yet have in the Jewish world, both in terms of um, kind of static textbook or curricular materials and also um, kind of online portals that allow young people to engage with current events, but with the Jewish lens. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> I want to just go a little bit deeper into the, the, the role of education research. You, you thanked the people on the call who are taking this Seriously, and I, I I also want to acknowledge that you know funders are are impact oriented and action oriented, and research is slow, and the 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 implications aren't always clear. And I was just wondering if you can give us a little bit more about um, how funders can think about investments in education research. Yeah, it is for sure slow. I mean, this project was started in the year twenty. 12. Okay. And yet, in part because I have been studying children in during every Israel Gaza war since 2012, I have essential information that I have been working to help educators around the Jewish globe, literally from Mexico City to Germany. I have been getting inundated with questions from educational leaders who know that now we have information about how young people learn and think and feel and process exactly. I mean, obviously we have never been in a moment this dark and this difficult. And also because I have been doing this research for so long, I know how to help educational leaders support children in this moment. So yes, it is slow and it is painstaking and the, um, the results are not you know, within six months knowable. And yet, when we do research today, that really um, helps us better understand how young people learn, think, and feel. It really deeply impacts the ways that we are able to support those people three, five, 10 years down the road. And that also matters. It is an investment, not in the present students, but in the students of the future. Right, great, thank you. Um, you, you mentioned the, the moment that we're in right now, so I want to sh shift to that a little bit. So since October 7th, um, in what ways, um, if any, has your has your thinking about Israel education and children's understanding um, about Israel um, or the practical implications of your work, how have those things changed, if they have? Yes, they have both um, underscored what I already knew, which is that children are learning, thinking, and feeling about horrible details of the conflict from a very young age. That was clear from the Children's Learning About Israel Project research. And there are layers of trauma of this current moment 
that were not true even in the darkest days of the 2014 Israel-Gaza war called Operation Sukhaitan, which was until this moment, probably the darkest, heaviest moment. Um, as part of another project called the Learning and Teaching About What Matters Project, which is also housed at the Mandel Center at Brandeis, I've been doing a lot of work interviewing young people now, not in 2012, but in the wake of this particular war. And one of the things that is most profound to me is that children know horrible things. They know that those things are incredibly, incredibly scary. One child I interviewed uh, in November, her name, we'll give her a fake name, Dahlia. One of the things that she said to me like the second we sat down, she said, don't tell me not to worry. Don't tell me not to worry because every time you tell me not to worry, I know you're lying. Please just tell me how to live with all this worry. And that is the message that I have heard again and again from children, many of whom um, think that they have too much access to information the hostage posters are everywhere. The trauma of the Jewish people is everywhere. And concern about civilians in Gaza is everywhere. And that is overwhelming. I want help processing. And some children think the opposite. I don't even know enough. I know this is so important. I know this matters and I want adults to talk to me about it more. And um, one of the things that I've heard repeatedly from children in the wake of October 7th is that they need time and place to process not only the initial traumas of October 7th, not only the war, but also the politics about the war in the United States. That's a lot of layers of very difficult things that young children are thinking about, that they want help, but they don't want it to be everywhere at every moment. So there has to be a time and space for children to process but it can't be every time and every space where there is no more room for joyful Jewish living, which is something that also deeply matters for the experiences of children. Thank you. Um, can you kind of take a step from Israel education to sort of educating kids about anti-Semitism and just talk a little bit about what your work can teach us about how to talk with young people of multiple ages, um, young American Jewish students about anti-Semitism. I am just this week, Susan, writing an article about what I learned about anti-Semitism from the children in the Children's Learning About Israel project. The children had a kind of a concept of anti-Semitism, but not the words anti-Semitism in the early elementary grades. And they knew this because we celebrate Jewish holidays like Purim, and Passover, which have embedded in the stories of the holidays, ideas about people not liking Jews. And so even very, very young children know this idea that someone could hate the Jewish people or want to destroy the Jewish people. Um, only in the upper elementary grades, fourth and fifth graders in particular, start to be able to have real language for talking about anti-Semitism. And there's also a shift that children undergo between imagining anti-Semitism in the younger grades being something long ago and far away. Again, think about the story of Passover. That is something that happened in Egypt a very long time ago. Two, in the upper grades, being upper elementary school grades, being able to say, wait, also anti-Semitism happens here in the United States, it happens now in this moment. And children also have a shifting understanding of the role that Israel plays in global anti-Semitism so that those upper elementary school children will often say Israel happens um, in Israel or around Israel. And by the time kids are in middle school, they can start to say, well, actually, Israel is kind of functions as a magnet for global anti-Semitism. It's not that it happens in Israel, it that, it's that it happens around the world in conversations about Israel. And understanding that developmental trajectory can help us start to think about what it means to support children as they themselves might be facing local homegrown versions of anti-Semitism in this moment. 
Right. Uh, there's a question about where the article about what kids know about anti-Semitism might appear. Do you know? Oh, I, I have not um, sent it in for review yet. I do not know. So um, circle back to me in a few months and I will tell you that. Great. Um, okay. And this is like sort of the final question that I have. And then, you know, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to get more questions from, from the viewers. Um, I guess this is the obvious question. So things, you know, things are in Israel and here are feeling dark and, um, and sad and quite overwhelming actually. Um, so I'm wondering if you can just share with us what hopeful and optimistic messages we can take from your work, Sivan. That is why I love working with children because children have this immense, tremendous superpower ability that adults do not have. We adults have other superpower abilities that many children do not have, but they also have a, a kind of superpower. And um, I noticed this most profoundly in 2014. Again, there was a, a terrible, terrible war. And this war, the catalyst for that war was the kidnapping and murder of three Israeli teenagers. And the children that I was interviewing from the Children's Learning About Israel Project were in second grade at the time, and they knew horrific details about the kidnapping and murder of these three Israeli teenagers. I mean, they just, they really knew quite graphic and gruesome information. And as I was inside, just had massive upheaval, emotional upheaval, listening to these children talk about horrific crimes committed against Jewish people. The children in the next sentence, they would tell me these terrible details and then the next sentence they would say, but it's okay, it won't always be like this. It can't always be like this. Let me tell you about the future. And they were able to hold at the same time, terrible trauma, terrible information about gruesome, gruesome details and have hope for a better future, a more peaceful world that they knew did not exist in the moment, but that they still believed with their whole hearts could somehow be. Because how could we possibly sustain this moment? I mean, it's not sustainable. We cannot. There has to be something better. And every time I talk to children, they remind me that there is a, the current tragedy and there can be a better future. And I wish we could end on that note. That's so uplifting and beautiful. So thank you. Um, we were going to open to questions, but I, I actually, you, you you said something that I, I didn't ask your permission to ask this question, but I'm going to ask it anyway, and you can just say if you don't want to answer it. Um, Sivan, you're, you're not only a researcher, but also a parent. Um, and I'm just wondering what it felt like for you personally to live with these stories over time, with these young people over time. I mean, you really, you take them in when you when you are interviewing them about such intimate things, about their thoughts and feelings. So just wondering if you could talk just a little bit about the work. Yeah, I, I think listening to these children has for sure changed how I parent. And I will say that I have made a lot of deliberate decisions as a parent to talk about very difficult current events, some of them about Israel, but also about George Floyd and also about the Trump Clinton election and also about a range of current events that we talk about at the dinner table and that I have developed a lot of parenting strategies to help my children process and think through as a result of listening to other children say very, very clearly, I want more help from my teachers and my parents and my rabbis thinking through what's happening in the world because I know it's very difficult and yet nobody wants to talk to me about it because I'm eight. Thank you. Um, okay, so I'm looking at the Q&A. There's one question here that I'd like to, to ask and then I, I really invite people to, to get in on this conversation. I shouldn't have all the fun. Um, the question is really, you talk a lot about teachers and parents, and there's a question really about the role of peers. Um, there's other things in the question, but I'm going to focus on, on the role of peers. And what have you found that's sort of most, um, 
what, what have you found about the role of, of peers and also how the adults in children's lives can either moderate or amplify the, the influence of, of peers in understanding? So, yeah, so I have a, the best sense of um, the influence of the peer group when it comes to children's thinking about politics. One of the things that really surprised me as I've been studying children's understanding of kind of political structures and political systems and political issues is that up until about fourth grade, children sound almost identical to one another and not at all like their parents when they talk about politics. So um, this became really clear to me as I would hear third graders and fourth graders say, um, oh, here are my very strong beliefs about Trump and Clinton also Netanyahu is the best since sliced bread. He is the leader of the Jewish people looking out for the Jewish people. And there's kind of a developmental piece where young children think about um, political leaders as benevolent figureheads, even if their parents are working to bring the downfall of those political leaders. And, um, and that really dissipates by the time the children hit upper elementary grades and is entirely gone by middle school. And in middle school, there's another peer phenomenon that happens that I, um, it's a little bit heavy. And I know we were just on an uplifting note, so I want to kind of name, but I have heard children on who themselves by the older middle school grades kind of self-identify on both the political right and the political left, going into online spaces in social media and saying, oh my goodness, there's this toxic world of discourse about Israel that my peers are engaged in and I cannot be friends with the people I thought were my friends because of the things that my friends former friends are saying online and I've heard this from children on the political right saying the second I say that I support Israel in this moment the second I get pushback from my peer group and the second I realized that the people I thought were my friends cannot be my friends. And I've also heard that from the political left, from young teens saying, the second I post concern about the welfare of civilians in Gaza, I get pushback from my peers and the people that I thought were my friends can no longer be my friends. And young teens are really, really struggling with what it means to navigate the world of social capital, which is so important in the healthy functioning of a middle school experience in the online toxic discourse that is not regulated by teachers or parents or any adults. I'm sure that there are listeners who are nodding their heads and saying, not just middle schoolers, but my children in their 20s or 30s or myself in my 40s or 50s. Or, I, I think that that um, the, the toxic discourse on social media is, I think, extremely painful for all of us. Um, Maybe the maybe the kids have something to to teach us, Do and you... and I think about that with the um the Talmudic term kal v'chomer, which basically means like if the small case is so, imagine the bigger case. Like if we adults are struggling, if our if our young people in their twenties are struggling, imagine how much more so our twelve year olds are struggling when they have their first access to social media and they get online and they are immediately bombarded with political discourse from their own peers about Israel, they are really, really struggling. I mean, maybe this is an obvious question to which the answer is abstinence, which we know is not like the greatest answer for these kinds of questions, but are, are what do you suggest for, for parents or teachers and how they can prepare students for this world that exists online? Um, and again, that is that feels dangerous and also confusing and painful. Yeah. It's really tricky. The first thing that I will say is the importance of talking with children before they get into online spaces about what they could anticipate there, right? So you might see this and you might see this. And I want you to know the second, I, I think this is the part that most parents miss, which is the importance of giving young people agency over their own decisions. So I often hear um, parents and community leaders in the Jewish community talk about arming young people to be equipped to participate in the political discourse online. And I think that misses a step, which is, hey, young person, 
to what extent are you interested in engaging in the toxic political discourse online? And there are some Jewish young people for whom that is their passion. They want to be the um, representatives of their own beliefs and ideas about Israel online. And those kids, great. They need help about learning how to do that in a respectful way that doesn't mirror the toxicity online. But there are other young people that makes them shut down. They make, they feel like I don't even want to engage with this question and they need other kinds of spaces, not online spaces, much friendlier, much lower stakes places where there is not going to be a record forever in the digital footprint of the internet where they can ask ideas and questions and not be advocates, but be wanderers or also talk about other things. And so I think the, the piece that usually gets missed is giving young people agency about how much they want to engage, in what kinds of spaces they want to engage, at what moments they want to engage, and to not see um, a decision not to be the voice piece of the Jewish people online that is not an unreasonable decision for a 12-year-old to make. Absolutely. Um, we're coming toward the end of our time, and I sort of wish I would have um, save my uplifting question for the end, but I will ask Sivan, is there anything else you would want to say <clears throat> to this group of interested listeners and looker lookers um, about your work and about Israel education more generally or about this moment or anything? So I want to give a shout out to all Jewish professionals who are managing really, really difficult politics both within the Jewish community and um, outside of it at this moment. Jewish professionals are exhausted in the post-COVID and uh, in the middle of this war reality. And um, the work of education in particular has always been impossible and it is just growing harder by the day. And so whatever you can do to support the Jewish professionals in your communities to make it possible for them to sustain this difficult work over time is really, really important and holy work that you can all be doing at this moment. Um, and I would also say, I'd like to say just on the research front that it is a never ending process to try and learn about how young people learn, think and feel about the moment because the moment is constantly changing. And so um, along with my colleague, Dr. Lauren Applebaum, we have a new project called the Learning and Teaching About What Matters Project in which we have spent a tremendous amount of time over the last year listening to Jewish fourth and fifth graders in supplementary schools and in day schools think about the present moment. And that present moment contains all sorts of things like climate change and political polarization and gun violence, and also rising anti-Semitism, and this war, and the hostage situation. And children know about all of this, and they care deeply about all of this, and they are desperately seeking the help and support of their grandparents, and their parents, and their educators, and their rabbis, and their Jewish community, and whatever we can do collectively to help make sure that um, children who are living in the same messed up world that the rest of us are living in have a way to hold their heads high and to continue to say, I am proud to be Jewish. I am joyful about what it means to be Jewish. And I also know that I live in a broken world at this moment. Um, that is deeply important work. Thank you so much, Sivan. I mean, it's hard to imagine an education researcher in a cape, but uh, Sivan, you're, you're really a superhero here. Your work is gorgeous. And extremely important. So I thank you on behalf of really everybody for, for doing it and for bringing it to us. Um, thank you. Thank you. Well, I couldn't have put that any better myself. I am so grateful to you both uh, for, uh, for this conversation. I realized uh, that I was so excited to dive right in that I actually uh, jumped right over introducing myself at the beginning of the program. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Beth Cooper Benjamin. I'm the Director of Programs and Peer Networks at the Jewish Funders Network. 
Uh, and on behalf of JFN and uh, Genesis Philanthropy Group and the Salida family, I am so grateful to uh, to Dr. Zakai and Dr. Cardos for joining us today and for sharing, uh, as Susan said, this uh, really beautiful and urgent and uh, illuminating work with all of us. Uh, and I, I know that everyone here has taken something away that they will bring to their own relationships with young people and hopefully their funding and their reading and their engagement in community. So uh, thank you again for your time and your expertise. Uh, I know that everyone has, has uh, gained a great deal from this conversation. Um, and uh, I hope that you will join us, uh, folks will join us again for some upcoming JFN programming. Um, we have some uh, some interesting programs coming up in the next uh, couple of weeks again that I just want to let folks know about. Uh, next week for JFN members, we have uh, a program with um, uh, the author of the book Frayed, Yair Edinger, who will be facilitating a conversation about the uh, diversity within the religious Zionist community in Israel with a, a panel of members of that community. We have on Tuesday, May 7th, uh, another research presentation. Um, this one uh, is going to be um, speaking with um, uh, this is going to be speaking with uh, the authors of the recent study on American Jewish philanthropy uh, that was uh, that was published by Ruderman and Lilly School faculty, and um, we uh, and we ha will have a briefing post Pesach with uh, JFN Israel's director. Sigal, uh, who will be updating us on um, needs assessments for funding in Israel. Uh, so please look at JFN's uh, website and, and newsletter for additional details about those programs. And we hope you'll join us. And thank you all again.